I was reminded that more than likely in this room, there are hundreds of Joseph stories. Maybe every one of us in this room has a, has a Joseph story. A story of betrayal. A story of unfair circumstances. A story of abandonment. A, a story of your life, a part of your life, where physically you felt this was the end. Mentally you felt there was no place to go from here. Spiritually, you felt like you were in the pit and there was no way out. And as I was worshiping, I, I thought back, and I don't know why, so I think this is just for you. I was thinking back to my own childhood and to remember those times where my brother and my sister and I were left alone for days in an apartment to fend for ourselves. Had no idea if mom was coming back. Didn't know where that would lead. Had no idea what tomorrow held. Wasn't sure that anyone loved me. Maybe that's you tonight. Maybe that's you tonight. I want to encourage you. God does love you. And he has a plan for your pit. And he hasn't forsaken you. And he's not going to leave you alone. And he is going to redeem. And he's going to make all things beautiful in his time. And indeed all things work together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. After this morning's service, I, I found myself kind of reflecting. You know, one of the bad things about teaching three services is you have to listen to yourself three times. You have to take in your own words. And about the third time you're going, okay, well that's fine, but that's for them. And it's always for me, it's always for us. The word of the Lord endures forever. And I wanna encourage you tonight, let this passage touch you personally. Don't make it about somebody else. Dig in and let God speak to you as we look at the betrayal of Joseph. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that you are the redeemer of lives from the pit. Thank you that you're the rescue. Thank you that in our deepest, darkest moments, you're still the brightest light. Lord, you always have a plan, and though we may not see it in a given moment in time, behind the saying, the things that go on in our lives is a God who loves us, whose thoughts towards us are good. They are a future and a hope. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless us tonight. Speak to us through your word, through the story of this incredible man, Joseph, who's betrayed, belittled, abandoned, physically left to die, and yet, not only did you rescue him, but you saved the whole of the Jewish people through him. And so, God, we bless you. Pray that you'd speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 12, Genesis chapter 37, if you'd turn there. And then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, and you're going to see Jacob bouncing back and forth between his real name that he now is, which is Israel, governed by God, back and forth between Joseph, heel catcher, schemer. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. 
And so he said to him, here I am. And then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. And so he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. And so below Bethlehem to the south, on the very edge of the Negev Desert, is this little community. This place, it would be hard to eke out a living. And so the brothers are out in the fields tending their flocks. And so here, Israel, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, sends Joseph, the youngest amongst them, out into harm's way. He knows that jo Joseph's had this dream. He knows that the brothers despise him. Uh, he knows that that dream includes uh, he and his wife bowing down to Joseph. There's pretty much nobody who's really a fan of Joseph at this point. And you can almost see, much like the Lord Jesus when he sent the disciples out in the boat in the throat of the storm, God doing something in Joseph's life that you would probably choose to not allow to happen to yourself if you were able to stop it. And I want to share with you that God often pushes us out into storms. God allows us to be thrown into pits. God allows terrible things to happen in the lives of even good people. And I think one of the great fallacies of Christian living is that once we get saved, everything's going to be a bed of roses. That you'll wake up every day and there'll be angels beside your bed singing hymns. That everything you ever engage in is going to go perfectly as planned. And that no evil will befall you. And that's simply a falsehood. Not only do bad things happen to good people, very often it's in those bad things that we learn to trust the Lord all the more. Lean on him deeper and grow in ways that are unfathomable to us. That's the case here in Joseph's life. And now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. He's the youngest. He has no idea really where he's going. doesn't know where the brothers are. And so he's in an untenable situation, ill-equipped, ill-prepared, and he's relying on really the goodness of a stranger. And the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? Now, I want you to notice something. It doesn't say who. It says what? And that is an accurate translation of the original language. It's not the who. It's not where are your brothers. It's what are you really looking for out here? You see, because perspective often is the thing. You can go into any given situation, you can go into almost any area of your life, and what you are looking for will greatly affect the outcome of what you find. If you are looking for the hand of the Lord in your life, then often you will find the hand of the Lord in your life. If you are not looking for the hand of the Lord, often you will find only the circumstances, the situations, the people, the places, and you will often miss the hand of the Lord. So the question is, correctly, what are you seeking? And so he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. That's one of a myriad of ways that Joseph could have answered that question, what are you seeking? He could have said, well, I'm seeking to get right with my brothers. He could have said, you know, I was a little bit off the charts with this whole dream thing, and I want to make it right. You see, sometimes we're, we're tempted to put Joseph on a pedestal here. There was an opportunity for Joseph to actually make this situation different than it was. And so ask the question, what are you seeking? And he says, well, I'm seeking my brothers. I'm doing what my father has asked me to do. And then the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And so Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. 
what do you do when God puts you into a situation where it's likely to not go well? You see, what we see here initially is what we would call the works of the flesh. And those things the Apostle Paul said writing to the church of Galatia and they're in chapter five are actually evident. In other words, they're evidentiary. There is a way that you can discern the works of the flesh by the evidence of the things that you're judging. And as the Apostle Paul continues there in Galatians chapter five, verse 19, he said, which are adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lewdness and idolatry, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, strife, selfish ambitions, dissensions and heresies. And by the time he gets to the middle of this list, before he lists some of the biggies again, there's a little tiny four letter word in there and it's envy. One of the most despicable works of the flesh that plays out in our lives in, in such a great way is envy. People can transition into a flesh monster almost quicker over envy than I think most of the other things listed in this list. When you begin to think that someone else has something that you deserve and you envy them, the result can be hatred, covetousness, contention, strife, all the rest of it, it's actually been bred by the envy itself. And so what's happened is the family has become envious of Joseph and Joseph has become envious of the brothers. This is a family where envy has infiltrated the family. And Apostle Paul would remind us that I told you beforehand that those who practice such things. Remember this morning, if you were here? Those who make a habit of being envious, those who make a habit of being jealous, those who make a habit of having outbursts of wrath, or those who make a habit of having selfishly driven ambition, those who make a habit of causing dissension and strife amongst other people, those people don't inherit the kingdom of God. You're not gonna see the work of God. And so until they deal with the envy, the work of the Lord is actually blocked out of their lives to some degree. God wants to do it, but they're not ready to receive it. And I ask you a question tonight. Are you in a place where you can receive the work of the Lord? Have you placed yourself at the feet of Jesus in these areas where you're tempted to walk in the flesh? because no one in this story is in that place yet. Not the brothers, not Israel, not Jacob, and not Joseph. They're all practicing things that they shouldn't practice. Joseph's brothers are gonna sell him to merchants. That's not what you do with somebody that you're trying to restore the relationship with, amen? That's, that's not a work of the spirit. Well, we'll just sell you into slavery. That's a further work of the flesh. Do you see the picture here? That the work of the flesh begets further works of the flesh. When, when you begin to walk in the flesh, you may have no intention of going too far. You want it to just be, well, it's just a little envy. It's just a little strife. It's just a little jealousy. It's just a little covetousness. It's just a little of something. But that little of something becomes a big something in your life because that little something is not happy staying little. It wants to gain control over you. That's what the enemy's trying to do. The enemy wants to take that strife and do exactly what he does in this story, turn that strife and that envy into hatred that leads to murder. They want to kill Joseph because they're envious of him. And of course, the prime picture of all of this uh, is exactly what Jesus was getting at in Matthew 5. And Jesus speaking there, he says, you've heard that 
It was said of those of old that you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You see, little things can turn into big things. And brothers and sisters, this is a critical component of every believer's spiritual growth. Do not let little things reside in your life. Because little things don't stay little. A little bit of any of these things that scripture clearly defines as destructive sin practices. Again, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5 that we have before us. When you look at those things, you're, you're likely to say, well, you know, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry at things God is angry at. God is angry with sin. But God is not angry with people, per se. He's angry that people are caught in sin. And so we let that anger kind of sit in there and fester. I don't know how many of you have roses at your house. Um, we like roses at our house. We have this one rose bush, and it's got the tiniest little itsy-bitsy thorns on it that when you look at it, you go, oh, that's not, a, that can't hurt you. And so I'm prone to not wear gloves when I'm clipping roses, when I'm trimming them back. The big rose thorns, I can kind of get my hands around the thorns. They're big enough I can see them. But those little tiny ones, I'm just dumb enough to grab them by the stem and figure that cannot hurt me that bad. And then about three weeks later, there's all these little red marks on the palm of my hand. And inside of each one of them is one of those little tiny thorns. Festering away. And you look at it and go, man, how could something so small be so painful? It's because there's no fear involved in the small things that you end up with those sores. And so I encourage you, have fear of the small things that God has clearly shown you should not be in your life. Maybe it is jealousy as it is here. Maybe it's envy as it is here. Maybe it's something much worse, but it's a small amount of it. Be careful, family. Because if you're not careful, an infection can start. And that infection can grow. Though they are not going to actually kill Joseph with their hands, don't you think their intent was to kill him? You see, we can begin to hide the things in our lives by simply doing less than we actually are thinking of and somehow we justify that that's okay with the Lord. We actually get proud about that. Well, I didn't kill him. I just hated him a lot. And so we justify the things that are negative that are going on in our lives by saying we could have done worse. That's like saying it's different being killed by a knife than a gun. Or an atom bomb. What's the difference? You're still dead, amen? And so whether you're vaporized or stabbed and bleed to death, you're still dead. And the point is this. Most people, when they look at those things in their life, will say, well, I'm willing to live with this much of it, so I'm just going to wield a knife. To the person who dies, they've been vaporized. We have to be careful, otherwise we're gonna end up in this exact same situation. There's some strange questions that kinda of come when you first read these first six verses. Much of what we would ask God about the negative things in our lives are actually along these same lines. Why are Jacob's sons pasturing the flocks almost 50 miles from home, because from where they are in, in in Hebron, 
to Shechem, which is further north, is a long ways. It's a multi-day journey. It's probably two and a half days on foot. What are they doing there? Maybe they didn't want anybody spying on them. We, we don't know. There, there's, some, there's some strange things. Can I tell you in your life, you're going to have some strange things you're not going to be able to wrap your mind around. It's like, why did this happen? What was God doing when he allowed this? A second question. Remember who's in Shechem. They're enemies. What are they doing hanging out with the enemies? There's a little key for us here in our spiritual walk. Don't hang out with the enemy. Stay out of the enemy's territory. Jacob's family had a horrible reputation. Remember what happened there. They murdered all the Shechemites. So it's not like they're going to be welcome there. This is a place where they were bound to get into trouble. And really the third, and to me the most puzzling thing is, is knowing that the sons hated Joseph, why does their father Israel send Joseph there in the first place? The world's going on. You ever thought about things in your own life that way? Why did God allow this? What, what's God, how come I got pushed into this storm? Why did my father send me to this place? How, how come that mistreatment that some of you have endured in your life, what was going on then? And the answer, the short answer, is actually very simple. God works together all things for good. And though you can't see it and I can't see it, we don't see it when we're in that situation. God has a plan somehow to work those things out because he's previewed the whole film. He's watched the beginning credits. He's watched the entire movie. He knows exactly who plays what part. That The word that we use in English pro, is providence is actually pro video. It comes from two Latin roots. It's pro video. It, it, it means to see before it happens by God. In other words, God knows what's going to happen. And so to him, it's not a strange thing at all. It's not a bizarre thing. It's him allowing to come into your life those things which he knows ultimately he's going to use for good. The problem is they're not good to you when they happen. And so you don't know the outcome that God's going to bring about, and neither do I. Very often as pastors, we have people come and they, they want to sit down and maybe they've gotten a diagnosis, something difficult, or, and you know, it's like, I don't know how many of you, you know, are, are Jeopardy fans, you know, you, our house, it's Jeopardy and the Wheel of Fortune. You know, that's what happens when you get old, you just watch game shows. But no, you, we're, we're watching and, and all of a sudden here Alec Trebek comes and he's, he's got pancreatic, stage four pancreatic cancer. I don't think he saw that coming. I don't believe that he knew that he was going to wake up, you know, a week after he goes to the doctor and they're going to be telling you, you have a very short period of time to live. And in case you don't know pancreatic cancer, it's, it's one of the most virulent forms of cancer and it is very, very, very difficult to treat and is normally fatal. So it's not a great diagnosis. Very few people beat pancreatic cancer. It's difficult. You see, we don't know why God allows cancer. We don't know why little children suffer from their parents doing the wrong thing. We, we don't know the answer to those things when that happens. But looking back on it, as we will look back on Joseph's life when we get to the latter portions of the book of Genesis, as Joseph himself will remind us God's still at work even in those difficult times where bad things happen to good people. God's providential hand, that picture of Romans 8, 28 working out in the Old Testament is always in view for God's kids. He is working all things, every last thing, 
every single component of everyone's life who loves the Lord. Notice it's conditioned. Romans 8, 28 is a conditional promise to those who love the Lord. All things work together for the good to those who love the Lord. Don't miss the condition. All things do not work together to the good for those who do not love the Lord. God can do good things, but God actually works them together for good for those of us who love the Lord. And so even the bad things, the cancer, the car accidents, the loss of a job, the maltreatment by family, the difficulties that you're going through right now tonight, I guarantee you, because God's word declares it to us, that if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, one day you will look back on the circumstances and you will say, God worked those things together for my good. He will do it. Not he might, he will. That's his promise to us. As Paul opens up that beautiful eighth chapter of the book of Romans, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, amen? So, so you, you, you look at your life differently as someone who loves the Lord. But in this, we can surely see the road to betrayal. Pick up verse 18 with me. And now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Now imagine that your father is the one who sent you into this situation. Do you think you're gonna have a little bit of dysfunctional family syndrome? I don't know if that's a real deal, but I just made it up. I'm pretty sure you're gonna be going, what in the world is up with my family? My dad sends me out here in the middle of nowhere, 60 miles from the house, to my brothers who hate me, and now they're gonna kill me. Wow, this is great. This is the Lord working all things together. You think you might have a little bit of doubt going on about now? because he's gonna find out pretty clearly that they're out to get him. Then they said to one another, look, the streamer is coming. And by the way, the original, the original language there is they're actually mocking him. It's like dreamer boy's coming. It's like the dreamer dude. The guy who thinks he's all that because he sees dreams and we don't. So they have not forgotten his little dream about them bowing down. Come, therefore, and let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast have devoured him. And again, here comes the, the absolute insanity. We shall see what becomes of his dreams. It's like, we know how to fix his little dream issue. We'll just kiss, kill him. We're not going to be doing any bowing down to that guy. We'll take care of the whole thing. Now this is where God's providence comes into view. They think that's what they're gonna do. They set out to do exactly what they're thinking, but God's gonna intervene in the life of Joseph. All things work together to the good, to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Joseph is going to bear the line of Messiah. There is nothing that's gonna take him out one second sooner than God says so. But Reuben heard it, and here you can begin to see the plans of God. Now bear in mind, Reuben is on the, the bad list with the Lord. He's gonna be replaced. He's not going to be one of the 12 because of what he and his, his brothers do. Uh, while they're in Shechem, when they murder the Shechemites, the problem with Dinah and, and her uh, maltreatment. And Reuben heard of it, and so you can see now God working in his life, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let's not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but let's cast him into a pit which is in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. And so he's now got an alternate plan, and he presents the plan to the brothers. And so it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic. They hated that coat. That coat represented the firstborn inheritance. That coat represented the favor of Jacob, Israel. 
That, that coat was, was like screaming, dad loves me more, and they're going, he doesn't deserve it, and you can see the envy just eating them up. And the tunic of many, many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, for there was no water in it. And so in this journey that it takes Joseph to get from Hebron to Shechem, as he's making this journey, you got to think that he's been thinking, because he knows he's not liked by the brothers. He knows dad has now sent him out to the very guys that don't want to see him. And as he gets there, you, you have to think, you know, why, why would God allow this? Why would dad send me here? And then he begins to think, I, I, I'm guessing that he began to think, well, you know, I kind of have a little bit of this is on me. This whole dream thing, I, I could have just said those things to my father. I, I could have gone a little bit easier on them with the bowing down part. Sure, that's what I heard from the Lord, I believe. But did I really need to say it at that point in time that way to them? And here's why I'm saying this. There are a lot of things in your life that are true, but there are a lot of things in your life that are true that are not needful in the moment. That sometimes the best thing you can do with the word of the Lord that's been spoken to you is pray on it. And let God work in the hearts of those that are around you. But if you take the extreme view of saying, well, God told me, then you better be prepared to pay the price that's going to come with saying, thus says the Lord. Because there is a price to pay for using the Lord's name and saying, God told me this. And sometimes... It's extreme. You see, in, in Joseph's case, this is actually the reason that they're wanting to kill him. It's not as much the code as it is the dream. They don't want to serve him. He's the young kid. There's a lot of different ways that Joseph could have handled this that he chose not to do. And so he's going to be protected here by Reuben. There's a very dangerous conspiracy that you can see that's going on here. And the second thing that you see is really a, an even equally uh, dangerous indifference. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat a meal. And then they lifted up their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites. This is one of those passages of scripture that those who purport there to be inconsistencies or errors in scripture, sometimes this one comes up. I was teaching at the Bible college, I got handed a pamphlet by a student and it was a supposed 1,000 or more discrepancies in the Bible that proved the Bible wasn't true. And this was one of them. And I wanna walk you through this. Coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices and balm and myrrh and on their way to carry them down to Egypt. Now remember that this is the main trade route. So you have a couple of roads that travel through this, this region. Uh, when we're in Israel this coming month, um, we're actually going to go to this particular crossroads because at this particular crossroads is none other than the city, the Tel of Megiddo. You know it as Megiddo or the hill of Armageddon. But at that hill is the crossroads going south towards Shechem and going south towards the Jordan River Valley and going south towards the camel trading routes that would come from Egypt and also from the Nabataeans that inhabited the land of Edom, which are also the kin, the kin folk, of these Ishmaelites. And so Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. And then Midianite traders passed by, and so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and so they took Joseph to Egypt. Oh, there's two groups of people there, isn't there? Aren't there some Ishmaelites and some Midianites? Or what, what's that? All in a matter of a, two sentences. 
Did they sell them to the Ishmaelites? Did they sell them to the Midianites? What's going on? If you look at them, remember who this is. Remember exactly who this is because the only way that you can actually understand this is by looking at the history of these people. And in fact, when you look at the price that's paid for them, they don't even get, they, they, they give them a 30% off sale because the price for a normal slave is 30 shekels. I said, well, we can get 20 shekels out of them. That's good enough. But they're going to sell them to these camel traders. And in the process of doing this, you can see how they're just completely indifferent to the plight of their brother. They're saying, well, we don't want to kill him, but we'll just torture him. That's better. That's, again, what envy and strife can do. That's, that's what happens when you begin to think the wrong way. That, in essence, is what Jesus did, was, had done to him by his own people. Amen. But in this, you can also see a, a very depraved design in the minds of these, these brothers. It wasn't likely that if Joseph was sold into slavery that he was coming back from Egypt, amen? We're going to see in the book of Exodus that when the Jewish people ended up in Egypt, they stayed there for 400 years. So, so nobody's coming back from that kind of slavery. They're, they're figuring, look, this is how we'll get this over with. We'll, we'll have it done. It, it'll be finished. And when you allow those little festering things to, to exist in your life, they just create this endless string of really bad things. Now, you would think someone would have woken up. Here, Reuben's acting in a way that you, you kind of go, well, no, maybe he's going to change. But isn't that the way you have long-running family strifes? Isn't that the way you have civil wars that exist in worlds, you know, in countries today? You know, sometimes when you look at the, the Middle East and you realize that there's almost no area of complete peace. Most of the region, other than Israel, are the descendants of Ishmael and Esau. They're actually brothers. And yet, not only do they not like each other, they legitimately hate each other. That's what happens when you allow these things to fester. And so first he calls them Ishmaelites, and then he calls them Midianites, and then he calls them Ishmaelites again. So who are they? And it's actually, when you look at it, it's, it's a fairly interesting study. Because the Ishmaelites are the descendants of Ishmael, who is the son of whom? Abraham. Through Somebody's got to know it in here. Hagar. Through Hagar. And after Hagar, who comes on the scene? Keturah. Who do you think birthed Midian? Keturah. Who is the wife of who? Abraham. So the reason that he uses these two peoples is because they're Abraham's children. Who is Isaac? Abraham's son through? Sarah. Sarah. This is a family feud. This is brothers and sisters fighting each other. This is all about inheritance. This is the craziness that happens. And so what you have here is you have one mom, so these are half-brothers, both the Ishmaelites and the Midianites, they all have a common father. That common father births Isaac, who births Esau, who gives birth to the Edomites, mortal enemies of the Jewish people. And so this is a picture of the reason that you see the conflict that is in the land that is called Palestine, but very specifically the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land of Israel. And so around the Jewish people to this day are, guess what? The descendants of Ishmael, the descendants of Midian, and the descendants of the Edomites. And so you have this family feud. So being absolutely correct, they sold them to the other side of the family. That's what happened. And so both is correct these two little groups wouldn't have traveled by themselves by this time, as far as we know of Ishmael's story. Maybe there's a hundred of them. 
There's probably much less than that of the descendants of Midian, maybe a dozen, two dozen at the very most. And so for you to travel in a caravan with 20 people was like, hey, come take our stuff. So they were traveling together as family. And sometimes when family gets this type of a seed of anger and angst in it, it just affects the whole family. So be careful what you allow into your family. You can also see the darkness of the deception that's going on here. Verse 29, and then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, the lad is no more, where shall I go? And so they took Joseph's tunic and killed the kid of a goat and and dipped the tunic in blood, and then they sent the tunic of many colors And they brought it to their father, and they said, we found this. Do you know whether or not this is your son's tunic? And he recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. And a wild beast has devoured him. Without a doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces, and then Jacob tore his clothes. And again, you can see him bounce back and forth between Israel and Jacob and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son for many days and all of his sons and his daughters arose to comfort him but he refused to be comforted for he said I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning and thus his father wept for him and now the Midianites who had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar the officer of the Pharaoh and the captain of the guard and so here Reuben is absent when all of this happens but, but they concoct this plot, the, this, this deception, if you will. In other words, what you have here is a picture of how one sin leads to another th- sin. Look at it. It begins with envy. It begins with strife. It begins with jealousy. It begins with non-active things, one might say. Things that you could, you could actually say, well, you know, it's just in my heart. It's just the way I'm thinking. You know, I can control this. It won't be that big a deal. Where does it end up? Not only do they throw him in the pit intending to kill him, but they decide that's not going to be good enough, so now they're going to actually torture their father with a lie. And they're going to sell their brother hoping he will never come back. All this starts because they don't deal with the sin when it is in its infantile state. They allow it to grow. And as you look at this, you can see how this unchanging law of God that you find there in Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And whatever you sow, that you will also reap. And this is a law both of science and of spirit. If you plant a corn seed, you're going to get corn, amen? Amen. You're not going to get beets or tomatoes or something. You're going to get corn from a corn seed. Whatever you sow. And spiritually it works exactly the same way. If you sow envy and bitterness and strife, you're going to reap envy and bitterness and strife. You're going to reap things in your life that you don't want. And so the picture here is deal with it when it is still in your head and you haven't done anything with it yet. When it's just temptation. When, you, when you're thinking about it and you're not doing it. And if you really look at it, they sent this coat of many colors. There in verse 32, they brought it to their father and said, look, look what we found. And they actually ask him to identify the coat. You talk about a plot. It's like, Dad, you, you, what do you think? You know, well, we don't think it's him, but, you know, do you think it's him? Oh, yeah, it's him. They're trying to deflect the guilt off themselves. We don't even know, but we wanted to bring it to you because, you know, we're the good kids. That's why we're telling you this lie. Now, if you remember back, as as we already studied, back in chapter 27, do you remember what Jacob did? He didn't do kind of the same thing He did exactly the same thing. 
he had killed a goat in order to deceive his father. Yeah, it's me, Dad. Yeah, want to feel my hairy arms? Check out the stew. He's now reaping what he's sown. He had sown deception into his own life. And now he's reaping deception. He had taught his kids how to deceive. He had put up with their shenanigans in such a way that they weren't sure where the boundary between right and wrong was. Can I tell you, if you're here and you're a parent, if you want your kids to have the best chance of success spiritually in this world, do not teach them to sin. They don't need any help. They're little sinners already. You teach them how to be righteous. You teach them how to live rightly before the Lord because in this case, as you notice, Jacob is deceived in exactly the same way and it is exactly the same result. Pain, anguish, sorrow, suffering. Ultimately, he's going to send Esau out. And Esau is going to become a mortal enemy. Just don't mistake this. This is what deception does. It's tragic. I remember one time I was asked by Pastor Chuck to minister to a pastor who had fallen in very severe sin. And Pastor Chuck just said, I just want you to spend time with him and get to know him and talk to him. And he'd become involved with another man's wife. And I spent probably three months. And I come to find out that his father, who was also a pastor, had done exactly the same thing. Same exact situation, in fact. His father and the office manager of their church. As I began to share with them, and I, I implored him, I begged him. I said, you have to repent, you have to turn from this. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, I'm a pastor and I know God will forgive me. I know his grace is sufficient and I just don't want to be married to my wife anymore. I'm done. And I said, well, God doesn't consider it done. You took those vows before God. Do you, do you think that, that God's just going to allow you to walk away? And he said, yes, I do. And two weeks later, he was killed in a head-on car accident going to see the woman with whom he was having the affair. And I say that for this reason. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. And God loves his kids so much that he is not beyond taking any of us out to save his character, his nature, and his kids. This is serious stuff. Because what happens is that infection gets into a generation of people and it takes root and the fruit of it is so bad that God has no choice but to cut the tree down. You don't want to be in line for the acts of God. This family is going to pay a price like no other family in the course of human history. As we go through the, the life of Joseph, I'll share with you some of the things that have happened in the life of the Jewish people. But this is the harvest, if you will, uh, of betrayal. This is what happens. This is the price. Verse 32 could be translated this way, and they sent the long sleeve coat and had brought it to their father, unwilling to confront him personally, unwilling to take their story. Because very often when you go of yourself, when you walk into that situation, that's where God can say, you know, it's really time you repent. But if you're always looking to take the easy way out by sending the text, sending the email, 
not taking time to, to talk to someone face to face. Sometimes the Lord uses extreme measure. And so the servant goes, what a, what a brutal way to minister to their own father. What a heartless way. And because Jacob is prone to jump to conclusions because he himself had done this very thing, what do you think he's gonna think? You see, sometimes we put ourselves into positions where the enemy can just do these things to us. And his family is gonna try and comfort him, but to absolutely no avail. And, and Jacob is gonna lament much, many years later this whole situation, but God is actually still at work in all of this. And that's the, the actual beauty of it. And it's the, the place I want to leave you tonight as we wrap this up. When man has done its worst, God is still working to do his best. When, when man has done his worst, God is still working to do his best. It's not over until God says it's over. Amen. That's the story of every one of your lives. You may not realize that yet. You may not know it yet. You may think it's not true. But the truth is, as a child of God, when, when you're done messing around, God is still working because he has plans for your life. And he's working those things together for good. And so the more that we help God out by doing things that are right and righteous, the shorter the path is to the goodness of the Lord. That is such an important part of our part in God working in our lives. You know, sometimes we, we almost fall on grace like it's an end-all cure-all. And yes, it is an end-all cure-all to our salvation. You've been saved by grace. It came to you by faith. That's an absolute. But the part where you're becoming more like Jesus, you have a hand in that. You can either help God make you more like Jesus or you can hinder God from making you more like Jesus. What do you think these brothers are doing? They are hindering God from making them more like him. And so what do you think God's response is gonna be? Well, that's okay, I don't really care about you. No, it's not. He's gonna say, look, if I have to, I'm gonna take you to the woodshed. We're going to the woodshed, you're gonna get a whooping. And if you don't like the first whooping, you'll get the second, the third, the fourth, and the tenth. And eventually, if you can't quite get the message, then maybe he's just gonna say, you know, maybe you should just come home. Maybe it's time for you to not infect the other people around you. God providentially is gonna be at work in Joseph's life. He's gonna take him safely to Egypt. He's gonna see him through his time that he's serving in Pharaoh's court. He's gonna be with him all of the way. And the important thing is, is that his, Joseph is actually connected to this very powerful ruler as he is the grand vizier, as he's the Pharaoh's chief assistant. We're gonna see him be used to deliver the entirety of the Jewish people. So God is at work, even though Joseph couldn't see it, the brothers couldn't see it, Israel couldn't see it. And in that way, again, he's a, he's a beautiful picture. Joseph is a beautiful picture of Jesus at Calvary, at the cross. The very thing that Peter would preach on there in, in Acts chapter three. This, this same Jesus whom God raised from the dead. Jesus was dead. Joseph was just buried and he was dead for all intents and purposes. And so in that way, we, we see again just this beautiful picture uh, of God working in circumstances that we think there is no way this is working out for the good. But not only does it work out for good, it works out for God's best. So let God change those things in your life, my life, that he's saying, you know, look, that doesn't belong in your life. You're reaping something because you have sown that same thing. That's why the Apostle Paul would go on to say, look, why don't you reap to the, sow to the Spirit so that you can reap of the Spirit? Because if you sow to the flesh, you're gonna reap of the flesh. And there's no question what we wanna do given those two choices. Trust God. Maybe you're in that pit place tonight. 
I'm going to have some of the pastors come forward. We're going to end in prayer. Sarah's going to come back up. Lead us in a closing chorus. And maybe you need to pray about your particular pit tonight. Maybe, maybe you need to get rid of some issue that is small now. It's just a little thorn that's pricked your finger. And you need to let God deal with that before it becomes a full-blown staph infection. Maybe you're doing great, but you know somebody who's in a pit. Maybe you're that person that could possibly pull them out. And you need some strength to be able to reach down into that well and lift your brother or your sister out. Take the opportunity to be prayed for tonight. Be careful. God will work all things together for the good, but let's give them a few less things to have to work together. Amen? Do it right the first time, as my dad used to say. Don't have to clean up the mess that you don't make. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is life. God, help us to walk in it live it Lord help each one of us in those areas where our lives have been touched by some disaster Lord we really don't know what to do but we know that you do and so we submit you uh, these things into your to do box and ask that you'd work on them and when you're ready would you show us what you'd have us to do where you'd have us to go what you'd have us to say Father we thank you for the time tonight and pray that you would bless us as your people Encourage us, strengthen us, Lord. Thank you for the challenges that we face and that when we are faithless, you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.